Hey, we are glad that you have joined us today. And our hope today is that you get something great out of this service, that God moves, that you lift your hands in praise just like you would if you were here live. So let's pray together for the service. Father God, thank you for uh, your word. We thank you that we can come together and uh, we can worship you. We thank you for that opportunity. Father, I pray that you send your Holy Spirit here today and amongst the people that are watching. We love you. We thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. our King. Come, let's bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what Savior is done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken a life. Oh, Jesus, I saved you, your name lifted I Oh, God, you have done great things. been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. Yes, you have, God. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great Got you to great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken a light. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name is. I, oh God, you have done great things. We sing hallelujah. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Yes, you have, God. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you've conquered the grave. You free every captain and break every chain. Oh, God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken a light. Oh, Jesus, I save you. Your name is did I, oh, God. You have done great things. You have done great things. Oh, God, you do great things. you too, Lord. Oh, you do great things.
mighty death separate Step past the you can't escape Your faithfulness and endless sea So full of grace and mercy We sing God is so good God is so good God is so good He's so good to me Hold it back Pass no more. My innocence has been restored. Forgiveness flows from your veins. Your kindness shows in all your ways. We say, God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. There's never been anyone like you. Never been anyone like you. You are worthy. You are worthy. There's never been anyone like me. Never been anyone like you. You are worthy. You are worthy. Hope is rising like the sun. The old is gone, the new is come. I fix my eyes on Christ alone. My rock, my shield, my cornerstone. We say, God is so good. Oh, God is so good. God is so good. He's so Good God, you are good. God, you are good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. God. God, you are good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. I love fall. Uh, I love it because there are a lot of things that are changing. Uh, the leaves are starting to change. Uh, the food that we eat, we start to eat chili and things like that. We start to wear sweaters and uh, we just see a lot of change that is happening. Uh, through life, we always see lots of changes. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Psalms 33, 11 says, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans 
of his heart are to all generations. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. And in a world where new changes happen all the time, challenges faces every day, I'm glad that God does not change. He is the same today and tomorrow and forever. His love for you is the same. From Genesis 3.15, the plan was God would redeem us, and that never changed. His love for you is the same. He died for you. That's where he started in Genesis. He fulfilled that, and today he still loves you, and his sacrifice was Jesus that he gave for you. And that is why we take a communion today. We want to remember that. We want to remember what he has done for us, and we want that to be a part of how we do this every week. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for this day. We thank you for everything that you do for us, Father. And most importantly, we thank you that you died for us because you loved us so we can be forever with you one day. It's in your name we pray. Amen. His body given for you and his blood spilt out for you. We are moving into a time of offering. And offering is something that we do as Christians because we want to. Because we love God and because we want to see his kingdom grow, we give to the church. You can go on our website at lincolnhillschristian.com forward slash give, and it will tell you many ways that you can give here to LHCC. Let's pray for the offering today. Father God, thank you for all the blessings that you give us. Let us be thankful every day and let us notice those blessings. Father, help us to give to you because we love you, because we want to see your kingdom grow. Let us do that out of a joyful heart. We thank you again for the blessings that you give us. For it's in your name that we pray. Amen. If you can hear this message, listen closely. To the exiled misunderstood or upside down. This is your message of hope. When problems come, use them. When enemies persecute you, love them. These struggles are a fire, refining you into gold. Look around. You are not forgotten. You are not alone. Challenge what is expected of you. This world is not your home. You are different. So over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the book of 1 Peter. And what we've discovered is that Peter was writing to the oppressed, abused, persecuted followers of Jesus living under the tyranny of the Roman emperor Nero. These people faced unimaginable circumstances. And in the midst of all of their suffering and all of their pain, over and over and over again, Peter reminds them that they were different, that this place was not their home, that they were made for some other place. And when we face trials and setbacks and heartaches, we would do well to remember that this place isn't our home either. Back in week one, we said that trials can actually be a good thing. You see, that when we come across trials, they can reveal the genuineness of our faith as well as draw us closer to our Heavenly Father. When we're experiencing trials and setbacks and, and heartaches, we can get to the place mentally where we think that maybe God has abandoned us or we're, we've upset Him and He's angry with us and He's punishing us, when in reality, He's using those trials and setbacks and heartaches to shape us into more faithful followers of His Son. In week, in week number two, we, were, uh, we noticed how important it was for the followers of Jesus to be holy because God is holy. We said that our path to Jesus is not holiness, but rather Jesus is our path to holiness. As we seek to imitate Jesus, we are going to look different than the world around us. And that's, that's a good thing. Looking different is a good thing. That's what holy actually means. It means set apart, dedicated and different. Last week we said that the followers of Jesus needed to have a different mentality than the masses, a different way of looking at the world than everybody else. As followers of Jesus, we must remember that our call to who 
always precedes our call to do. We are God's chosen people. We are holy and dearly loved. Regardless of what our neighbors might happen to think about us, regardless of the accusations that culture heaps and hurls upon us, God says that you are mine. And I proved it by the mercy I extended to you, lavished on you back at the cross. Today we're going to wrap up this series of sermons with the most encouraging message that you never wanted to hear. Jesus promised us many things, but he never promised us that things would always go our way. He never promised that our kids would always be little angels, that we would never have any health scares, that we would never hurt for money and always get the promotions that we deserved. But what we are promised, what Jesus does promise us, is that if we faithfully follow him, the world around us will persecute us. Well, that sounds great, doesn't it? I mean, (laughs) it really doesn't sound like great news. Uh, In the gospel, though, John quotes Jesus as saying, If the world hates you, keep in mind, it hated me first. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. See, if we choose to look like the rest of the world, and we just kind of choose to go with the flow, we'll probably slide on by. But if we choose to be different and live lives that look like the life that Jesus lived, according to him, we are going to experience persecution. Believe it or not, research indicates that even though we are living at the most peaceful period of time in human history, over 300 Christians are murdered each month because of their faith. More than 200 places of worship are destroyed every 30 days, and over 700 acts of violence are committed against Christians just because they love Jesus. In some corners of the world, persecution means that your family will abandon you or disown you. In other places, it can mean that you are arrested and beaten. In still other places, you can lose your job, your home, and your livelihood. When we encounter oppression, uh, our, our faith should be strengthened. When we encounter opposition to our faith and endure hostility because of our love for Jesus, we are encountering exactly what he promised we would, persecution. That's why it's so important for the followers of Jesus to have a different focus while they are in the fire. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 12 Peter says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. What Peter is reminding Jesus' first followers of is the fact that they should set surprise aside when it comes to the topic of hostility. When Jesus' followers actually start following him, they should anticipate resistance and pushback and opposition. Think about it like this. When Barack Obama was just a community organizer living in Chicago, nobody cared where he was born. Nobody cared about what school he attended. Nobody cared about what he thought about health care or what he thought about same-sex marriage or what he thought about socialism. But when he got into the arena of politics, conservatives felt responsible to point out his position, uh, positions on, on these issues and then vigorously oppose them. Same is true for Donald Trump. When he was just a billionaire firing people on TV, nobody cared what he said. Right? In fact, some of the same celebrities and politicians who have vilified him over the last four or five years were the same celebrities and politicians that would routinely uh, shower him with praises when they needed money for some of their pet projects. When President Obama and President Trump got off the sidelines and entered the political arena, they opened themselves up to the wave of hostility, animus, and opposition that comes with being the leader of the free world. While they lived in the private sector, they were not a threat. Nobody cared what they believed about issue this or issue that. But that all changed when they were elected to the highest office in our land. In the same way, Christians are not a threat 
while they sit on the sidelines. The spiritual forces of evil are not intimidated by the fact that we own Bibles if we rarely read them. They're not intimidated by the fact that we belong to a church if we rarely attend a church. The devil does not tremble at the fact that we might know God's plan of salvation if we never intend to share that plan of salvation with anyone else. It's only when Christians get off of the sidelines that our enemy perceives us as a threat, declares war against us, and unleashes hell upon us. In chapter 5, Peter describes our situation saying, Stay alert. Watch out for our great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The fact is, hell is unleashed upon us and it should not be a surprise. Christianity is not a playground. It is a battleground. And the followers of Jesus should expect enemy fire when we're engaged in battle and living like Jesus. Peter reminds Jesus' followers not to be surprised. And then he adds this in verse 13. He says, Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in His suffering, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing His glory when it is revealed to all the world. Now this is crazy talk, right? Be glad. No, 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 no. Don't be glad. Be very glad. Why? These trials make you partners with Jesus. Now let's be clear. Peter's not talking about the trials that we experience from time to time because of our politics, even though those trials are real. He's not talking about the trials that we might experience because of the color of our skin, even though those trials are very real. He's not talking about the trials that we might experience because of how much money we do or do not have in our pockets, even though that is a reality. Peter is saying to be very glad about the trials we experience because of our love for Jesus. Why? Because our sufferings for Jesus make us partners with Jesus. And we know how this story ends, right? We know how the movie ends. We know that when it's all said and done, Jesus wins. He will be victorious. But even with this information firmly in our minds, firmly established, even though we know this to be true, I think our default setting is still to avoid discomfort, to sidestep pain, to pursue ease and pleasure. Now, I'm going to be honest, I'm not making a, a judgment here. I'm making an observation about what I think is, is human nature. By and large, our default setting is for the path of least resistance. We don't want to have uncomfortable conversations. We don't want to experience tension or resistance. We prefer doing something easy rather than doing something hard. This, I think, is human nature. But when we begin to follow Jesus, we become more than just humans, don't we? Aren't we indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God? Aren't we empowered by Him to live a different kind of life? This plays out in some very predictable ways. It begins with people innocently pursuing comfort and pleasure. But to do this, they avoid opposition. However, Opposition, or as Peter describes it, fiery trials, they're necessary for growing our faith. Avoiding these trials and, and this opposition causes our faith to weaken and our spiritual muscles begin to atrophy. When our faith becomes weak, our lives will then become empty. And how we live begins to appear meaningless. And so to give life meaning, we pursue more comfort in all its various forms and fashions. And the cycle begins to spiral further and further out of control. And if we're going to be totally honest with one another, if we're going to lay all of our cards out on the table, we'd have to agree that this is the way that most Christians live today. They try to add just a little bit of Jesus to their broken lives rather than giving their broken lives to Jesus. And this only makes things worse because in the end, they wind up miserable until they decide that Maybe this whole Jesus thing isn't really for me. But there's a second approach, a second path, a different way of living that Peter challenges the followers of Jesus to embrace. It begins with a focus on living boldly. Instead of pursuing comfort and ease, we choose to live boldly and accept that sometimes following Jesus is going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be hard. 
When we step out of our comfortable spaces and live boldly, we'll face opposition rather than flee from opposition. And when we face opposition, our faith will solidify and we will draw nearer and nearer to Jesus. And the nearer we draw to Jesus, the more boldly we'll be able to live. Peter continues in verse 19, he says, So if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right. Trust your lives to the God who created you, for He will never fail you. There is no question about the fact that we are currently living at a time in our country's history when it has never been less acceptable to be a Christian. This is a fact that breaks the hearts of many and causes deep concerns about the future for others. They wonder that, uh, you know, what this persecution is going to do to our nation and what it will mean for the future of the church. And I would remind them simply of Peter's words that we just read. Suffer well, continue to do what is right, trust God because He will never fail you. Persecution doesn't weaken the church. Persecution strengthens the faith of Jesus' followers. When Ignatius of Antioch was approaching his own martyrdom in the Roman Colosseum, he knew what he was getting himself into. He knew that he would soon be with Jesus. His last recorded words are this, Now I begin to be a disciple of Christ. I care for nothing of visible or invisible things so that I may but win Christ. Let fire and the cross, let the companies of wild beasts, let breaking of bones and tearing of limbs, let the grinding of the whole body and all the malice of the devil come upon me. Be it so, only may I win Jesus Christ. 1800 years ago, the church father Tertullian proclaimed the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And this fact is just as true today as it was 1,800 years ago. Don't shrink back from opposition, but instead trust God because He will never fail us. Peter wraps up his letter, begins to conclude it with this in mind, saying, In His kindness, God called you to share in His eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus, So after you have suffered a little while, He will restore, support, and strengthen you. And He will place you on a firm foundation. Did you notice what what Peter did there? He juxtaposed our temporary sufferings with the eternal glory that God wants to share with us as His people. As the followers of Jesus, we must avoid taking the bait and falling into this very well-laid trap, this very crafty scheme of the devil. We cannot exchange eternal victory for temporary peace. The followers of Jesus are called to be different, and that means that we have to have a different focus in the fire. Christianity isn't a playground. It's a battleground, and we can endure trials and setbacks and heartaches because we know that these obstacles are shaping us into the likeness of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Look, I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what trials or setbacks or heartaches that you're finding yourself in the middle of right now. But I can assure you that you don't have to go through those trials and setbacks and heartaches all alone. What we're up against might appear to be insurmountable and the specter of doom and defeat may loom large in your mind. But, To close out this message and wrap up this series, I want to recall the words of our Savior Jesus Christ and what He said in John chapter 16, verse 33. He said, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. In Jesus, we are overcomers. We are victorious. We are not tied to who we've been or what we've done. If you're fearful about the future, there's hope. The victory is ours. We must only choose to be different, to let Jesus lead and faithfully follow Him wherever He goes. If you've never decided to follow Jesus, 
The scriptures are clear. Our first step in following him is repenting of our sins, literally turning from sin and turning toward Jesus and being baptized, being immersed into Christ so that we might walk in the newness of life, so that we might live a different kind of life and be indwelled and empowered by his Holy Spirit. If you've never done that, invite you to do that today. If you've got more questions about what it means to actually faithfully follow Jesus, I want you to know that we're here for you. You can reach out to us anytime and we'll go on this journey of faith right beside you. I'm going to pray and then we're going to continue on in our service. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word, for the insight and encouragement that it provides us. Father, we recognize that we're going to face trials and setbacks and heartaches. Help us to remember that we're not going through these alone. Help us to remember that we're empowered by your Spirit, that we're more than just humans. Help us to see that what we go through shapes us into the image of your Son, Jesus, for your glory so that your kingdom might advance. Father, help us in all that we do to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples so the gospel might spread and your name might be glorified. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When darkness closes in on every side When battles rage in the waters rise I fear no evil for I know Nothing can separate my heart from you Cause there's no weapon stronger than your love There's no weapon stronger than your love No heart, no death can overcome Faith can make a mountain And nothing is impossible for you I fear no evil for I know the truth Nothing can separate my heart from you Cause there's no weapon stronger than Just the